Sorry? I'm tiny. Okay. So I can tell you what I have Okay, sure, sure. Um, how much time do I have? 30 minutes or three weeks? Okay. Perfect. No, I Yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. I think that's perfect, yeah. Yeah, I think it should be fine. It's fine? Correct? Um, Uh, so hi, my name is Pratik. I work with uh, Avinash on Support B, and we are basically a single page application or customer support software, very much like Gmail. So think of us like if, if you so the background is if you're building let's say a Gmail where there's like a you know listing and then pages change, and so most people think of single page apps as apps which are just like one page right and uh, everything happens. But then I like to call it like multi-screen single page apps just to be more clear where the screens are still changing so you still have like a complete change in the screen but as such there is no page reload. So that's basically what I'm going to talk about how to build applications like that. So for example when you open a new email in Gmail right, the URL changes, the screen changes, you can bookmark the URL, you can open it elsewhere. If you go into let's say all tickets, uh, sorry, all email screen or if you go into start there's a different URL for that. So basically, how do you structure applications like that? So just to get a quick sort of idea of the audience, I mean, uh, how many of you guys have built a single page app? Okay, cool. So I'm assuming backbone or something. But how many of you guys have built a single page multi-screen app where the screens actually change? It's not just things being dropped around. Okay, so fewer. So, but most of you can basically appreciate the context, right? So how to do that? And uh, so I've written you know, blog posts on Backbone and I've met a lot of people and uh, I think the biggest problem is you know, it's not about ba using Backbone as such, I think it's about how to think the single page way. Like right, how do, how, do, how do I structure my application, how do I basically manage that sort of like complexity, right? Because most of us come from server side background or in JS we've just done small JS stuff so we don't know how to for example, desktop application is very well understood how to build, but not in you know, a single page app. So we'll just talk about that quickly. So, so, and these are just four or five small lessons that we've learned over support me. This is not an authoritative talk, just to get some ideas going. Uh, so one thing we figured out was that URL should be the entry point for every scheme. And what I mean by that is, so if you guys have used like the backbone router, for example, so you can, um, you can call the router and you can change the URL and do an action. Uh, anytime you want in your application. So you could click a link and you could uh, ask something on the screen to be changed and then you can change the URL <coughs> for the history. So it get, gets bookmarked, right? And But what we've seen is the other way is much better, which is whenever you want to change the screen, it's always better to change the URL and then let the routing kick in and do its thing. And the benefits of that is, uh, so for example, in support, we will set up these routes right when the application starts. So we say, Let's set up a new router, let's set up an open ticket route, which is just slash ticket ID. Uh, let's set up one which is label, label name, and let's set up a default listing, some of the routes, right? And and the benefit of that is now, let's say, uh, to change the screen, you just have to change the URL. You don't have to know, like to open a ticket, you don't need to know where, uh, which function has to be called. So for a simple application where you are just, uh, you know, you just have a couple of screens, a few click buttons or few links, you can do it either way, it doesn't matter. But here for example now if I, um, if through my search some logic I want to auto complete and hit enter, all I need to do is now know what is the ticket URL, just change the URL and wherever the routing is already configured it will kick in. But if you do it the other way around you always have to manage the complexity yourself. So. So for example, to open a ticket, I can just, you know, this navigate is essentially nothing but just a wrapper to change the URL and you can pass it some parameters so it's, and so you just like put the slash model list so slash three or slash four or whatever and and uh, what the routes that we had set up before will kick in. So I think always for a bigger application, it's better to sort of center it around URLs. Um, so the navigate thing is still using the history API to change the URL? Yeah, yeah it's using the history API to change the URL. But it's not uh, triggering, uh, the, yeah, it's not like calling the function and so for in Backbone you can do it two ways, right? You can execute the logic and then you can call the history thing just for preserving the back button thing. Hmm. But this is the other way around, actually the URL changes and then the router kicks in. So that's the point. The other thing that we realized is that uh, when you're building such applications, you can, 
<coughs> you, let's say you have a main div where most of your stuff shows. You can just call a show on that. You can just say, in jQuery, you can just say, okay, dollar main div for dot HTML, and you can put, you know, whatever you've rendered over there. But it's just like way better. And this might sound obvious. I don't know. Uh, probably to it me, it took me some time to appreciate this. But it's really amazing to create a, like a current view class which actually does the screen changes, which which is the one which is managing the actual screen changing and things like that. And I'll show you why it works better that way. So, so for example, we have this current view class, and what it, it exposes a method called set, which will basically you can pass it a backbone view, and it will render the uh, you know top level element dot el and show it wherever in the main area of the application. And what it will do is, it will actually keep a track of all the screens that have been rendered so far. It will keep track of URLs. So for example, as I said, you know, we change the URL first and then the other things kick in. So whenever it gets a call to change uh, the screen, it knows that, okay, by now the URL has already changed. So it keeps a hash of screen and URL. And uh, there's a few other things like sets of keyboard shortcuts or whatever. And every time it sets the current screen as the current one, it will set the, it will just tell the other screens that, okay, now you are not being displayed. So for example, you could do things like, okay, reduce the polling time if you're polling, or uh, if you're doing something expensive on those screens or whatever, if you want to garbage collect those screens, you can do that. So it, it, it makes for a really clean pattern that way. And there are other benefits we'll talk about. So, so as I said, the current view already knows about all your screens and URLs. So for example, now let's say, um, I want to say, I'm on some screen, I want to say, just give me the last listing back. So now I already have a hash of all the screens. I can just go through that and figure out, okay, which one was the listing type screen and show me that one. And again, I just change the URL. I, I don't, everywhere you say I change the URL, I don't actually render it directly, right? So these patterns tie in very well. So you could do things like that. You could, um, you know, you could, if you get a request to render a screen, you can actually check, is it already pre-rendered? Then don't call render on it because render is more expensive in operation. Just show it, just show the element. So you could do things like that. So the current view class really helps actually. And, and the other thing we realize is like you should use a lot of event binding. You should use a lot of event binding. And I think two years into the Backbone ecosystem, I think it is kind of a common advice that a lot of people already understand. But, uh, so I have no idea actually how other people do backbone code because I have not even seen that much backbone code. I have not met that many backbone developers building big apps. So I'm just assuming that these things are important. People don't know about them. So some of the event binding things are very obvious. I think by now people understand it. Like for example, if you have a view and instead you initialize some models or some collections, you obviously have to bind to those to know when they're fetched or when you know the models change. So those things are very, very obvious, which I think a lot of people should be doing by now. So for example, like if you're in the ticket view, we say, okay, if the ticket model is archived, uh, uh, if it is uh, spammed, if it's trashed, whatever, then do these kind of things. So this kind of event binding, I think right now is like very obvious. But what I'm talking about is the fact that you can bind to events which are not very obvious. So for example, again, going back to the current view class. So what the current view does is, whenever you ask it to render and show a screen, it will actually bind to certain events on that screen. So it will say, okay, bind to the archive, uh, if, if the event dispatches an archive screen. For example, in Gmail, when you are, click archive, it takes, I think in Gmail also, it takes you back to the previous listing. You know, if you hit, uh, <coughs> if you are in a ticket and you hit spam, it will take you back to the listing. So, so the current view class can actually just bind to these events and now, this actual view class doesn't have to worry about telling the current view class that you know what I've been uh, on explicitly having to call a refresh or a page change or something like that. So use event bindings between uh, you know where it's not very obvious and you want certain interactions to happen between different screens. And uh, and basically drawing from that, we should also dispatch more custom events. So for example, like we we dispatch like the archived event. Now, we don't worry about with who's going to use it. The current view class could use it or uh, you know, the, somebody else could use it. So dispatch a lot of current um, you know, custom events. We even have custom events like fetched and before fetch or before save. So you can like extend backbone or whichever framework you're using with more custom events. It just gives you more flexibility in terms of doing stuff. 
one thing also you know which we realized uh, is that it's it's really helpful to use an identity map sort of thing uh, which and what i mean by that is basically if you initialize in two places in your single page app you know a model with an id let's say 10 it should actually give you back the same object and why that is important is let's say you have an application like this where you archive the ticket uh, or you change something on it and you go back to the previous listing now you want that to be updated instantaneously and uh, if you don't use an identity map you'll have a different object even though it's the same id and unless you're using push to immediately you know change it or whatever it's it's going to be hard to keep those things in sync so we really like using an identity map it has worked out very well for us you could just quickly throw one together unfortunately badmo is not that modular so you cannot so you have to hack into the guts of it a little bit so and you can write test cases for it so for example what it does is if, if you are asked to create a new model it just checks if there's an old one existing and if it, there's one existing it just updates the attributes with the new one and just returns you that so very simple it, there's nothing fancy there so you, uh, you when you want to create a new model you check yeah if the attributes if something similar. if the id is or uh, if the id id is the map okay. and it's done transparently so that's why i hack into backbone.model so it's done transparently to you as a dev okay. i mean when you're writing the application you don't have to worry about whether there's another instance or not it just returns you the and and so if now the same instance is as i said being used all the screens will stay updated but this obviously depends if you're using event binding right so it obviously breaks down if you're not binding. So if, <coughs> if you're not binding events, then th the other screens wouldn't even know that this object has changed. It doesn't matter where it's changed. So, and this, all of this stuff is obviously a lot of complexity. I mean, so you can write great code or whatever, but I'm, I think you absolutely have to test drive that code. I think the ecosystem is <laughs> really good right now for test driving code. So for example, we use Synon.js. So let's say if you want to initialize a groups collection or something, right? It's really simple now. So you can say synon.mock, give me a mock on SP collections, give me. So this fell into backbone, but you can do it whatever. And in JavaScript, unfortunately, you have to use a lot of mocks because you want to avoid server calls. And uh, so for example, in, in Ruby, we don't use that many mocks. We, we make actual database calls and we actually use factories and we set up. And it's still reasonably fast. But here it's very difficult to do that because all the calls are being made to the server. So, but if, but if you see, it's still a lot of setups. So you have to set up a mock, you have to set up an expectation, you have to verify the mock, and I missed out the line where you tear down the mock. So you know, it is still a lot of work. But what you could do is, so you know, we have written some helpers to basically test this. So what we've written is like a test with mock thing where you can just say this class expects this, returns this, and then on that I expect this, and all this should happen when I do this. So this takes care of all the setup, verification, tear down for you. And so this makes it extremely simple. How do you make a mock of this HTTP uh, server request? Yeah, yeah. So, so you can use Synon.js, which also gives you. Um, so it will it will give you fake XHR requests. It will give you, and we have written something called Backbone Factory, which basically helps you. So you just give it some attributes. You give it if you guys have used uh, Factory Girl or one of the factories. So it'll give every time you want a new ticket object, it'll give you with an incremented ID. You can even say uh, if the name can be name plus a sequence number, so name one, name two, person one, person two, so it will keep doing all that for you. So you can like very easily test uh, your backbone code actually. So so just write these helpers. Uh, we've actually open sourced all of these helpers, the factory, everything I'll send, give links out if you guys are interested. And just remember that, I mean, all the best practices obviously like apply here, right, you know, like single responsibility, high cohesion in the class, you know, create, you know, whatever, you know. And just, just read the book, The Clean Code. I mean, this book basically covers 90% of all the best practices. And there's nothing different between like the best practices for Ruby or JavaScript that much. I mean, yeah, there's difference between event binding and how you pass on things, you know, using uh, closure eh, or whatever. Some of that stuff, but that's it, right? And uh, and so, yeah, these are the resources. Use Synon.js. This is the factory helper, a factory that I talked about. If you are testing backbone code, it's really, really useful. These are the Synonges helpers which we've written. And these helpers utilize the factory as well. So for example, you could say, if I make a call to the URL, uh, you know, slash tickets, give me a response which has three instances of the factory ticket. So you can like very easily basically test your code using these helpers. 
and so you guys are you know feel free to go and check those out and uh, how much time did i take uh, yeah, you have 10 minutes left for Okay, so I will just open it to Q for q and if you guys have questions actually. That, so I just wanted to give you guys some ideas on how to structure. I mean, obviously we cannot do a very big, like from like scratch to an application or something. So just ask questions. One question I have is, uh, what has been your experience with Backbone? And like today there are many more choices. Right. Angular and, and, and so many choices. Right. So if today you were to write an application, would you still use Backbone or you use use something else? So to be honest, uh, you know, um, um, so I'm not like a big programming language or frameworks geek really, I don't go around exploring that much. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> so I don't even know actually, yeah, there's Ember, you know, which does, and then there is like, you know, these and things yeah. which people have written for background which does Ember kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I think ultimately what really matters is the architecture of the application, that how mm -hmm. do you and then writing your own sort of custom stuff for your specific domain that can help you achieve these goals faster and more, making sure you have all the test infrastructure in place. So given all the infrastructure you have placed in Backbone, I think I would still go back and pick up Backbone because we already have that infrastructure. And one more question I have is, uh, I saw your blog on jQuery and uh, your Backbone, right. jQuery Mobile. Right. So what has been your experience in terms of performance with this combination? on different mobile devices like scroll performance and so actually the experience has been pretty interesting which is uh, so i spent about a week or 10 days trying to get this ice scroller working mm -hmm. and it didn't <laughs> okay. and i just said okay you know screw it i'll just like launch it and then i tried on like my mom's cheap 12,000 rupee Android phone and it just scrolls beautifully well because Android has already done that. Mm -hmm. So I think it's only a matter of time before I think iPhone, it's funny but I think iPhone has a lot of catching up to do mm -hmm. and I use an iPhone but uh, <laughs> I think, <laughs> so it's, uh, I think Android is getting a lot of that stuff right anyway so you don't have to use iScroller there, you don't have to, the performance is really amazing. I mean, mm -hmm. and, and iPhone the performance was actually shittier, at least my iPhone 4 it was shittier. Mm -hmm. so, but for us, it was clearly like the first launch and for that we were pretty happy with what we came up with. Again, more than that, what we wanted to really make sure was that it doesn't uh, sort of, oh, thanks. So it doesn't sort of hinder, uh, what we want to make sure is like we can still reuse the code a lot and as we push out new features, it's very easy for us to turn things mm -hmm. on and off for the mobile <laughs> till we figure out a mobile layout or whatever. So again, we wrote a lot of custom helpers. So I mean, if I could, Show you guys like some code maybe quickly. Um, so you know, so so for example, we've written this this innocent-looking little helper. Uh, so we've just written this very simple helper which says, uh, you know, let me. I don't know how to zoom in here actually. Command plus. Will command plus work in here? Oh. Okay. So you know, so we wrote this little helper here, uh, which says response to, which is like you know obviously inspired by Rails, uh, which uh, you know so you can set certain variables on a server side or JavaScript side to say okay is this a mobile device, is this a tablet device, whatever it is, and uh, then you can say. So for example, now we can very quickly do stuff like okay, just do this stuff for mobile, for desktop do these other things like uh, you know making the top bar sticky, rendering the view who's viewing less. So we can quickly turn features on and off. So I think, so for us that was more important because <coughs> as you're moving really fast with the product, mm -hmm. we don't want to like maintain two code bases and we do also don't want like sort of every time have to worry about okay, how will this render on the mobile. So we only turn on things once we've launched on the desktop, they're working and then you know we port it back <coughs> to mobile. Mm -hmm. So if you, as I said, I mean if you're going the single page apps way, it's a great idea to invest in your custom infrastructure a little bit, open source parts of it if it is generic. But definitely I think more than any particular framework, I think your custom infrastructure will help you a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm new to backbone words so of what you might know is, how do you deal with uh, undoing in action? So there are certain, obviously there are a lot of paradigms for it. One, uh, I mean, you can use the command paradigm where you basically, I think Pivotal Tracker uses that. And what they do is uh, everything is sent out as in a command queue and then that command queue can be executed elsewhere or you can do a, you know, undo stuff here. So we don't really have undo right now actually. Okay. I mean, you have to be absolutely sure of what you're doing. 
I'm just kidding. But yeah, so we don't have Undo right now. But I would assume that it's just basically the same sort of things. You just put actions in a queue and then execute the queue and be able to like roll back the queue, you know, okay. based on. Okay. So and I was just curious about how it would deal with the, the object ID that you were keeping in sync. How would it deal with? I mean, you are doing one screen, but. No, that's a, that's the idea that you know if you create an instance, it is all the same. I mean, so even if in different screens you are initializing, that's the whole idea of using the identity map versus having to actually check. Is that if you say new model ID five, to you it doesn't matter. If there is already one, it will return you the same instance back, and so everything should go in sync actually. Yeah, I think it. it so I wrote a blog post and then I had a lot of you know debates with even Jeremy on Hacker News, I think. And he's like, oh, you never need, I, you would never need an identity map, a lot of people there. I think the problem is, if you're doing just a single page at one screen, you probably don't. But if you're doing multiple screens, I have not come across a better solution, actually. I mean, but I would be happy to learn of better solutions, for sure. There are. Any other questions? Yeah, yes, man. I saw use the backbone in mobile also. So do you prefer using backbone in jQuery mobile or mobile? Uh, yeah, sure. So I mean, uh, so you know, as I said, we wanted to reuse most of our code base, <laughs> and we didn't want to write from scratch. So we wanted to achieve at least 90% code reuse. Mm -hmm. And so what we had to do, and I wrote a blog post about it. You could go to dev blog and check it out. What the only thing we had to struggle with for about a week was turning features on and off from jQuery. So for example, Bootst we use Bootstrap for styling and Bootstrap does styling. Backbone does all these routing and functionality. But jQuery mobile is unique in a way that it also does styling and it also does the functionality bits. Mm -hmm. But if you are persistent enough, you can find enough options to turn off. So for example, you could turn off the router, you could turn off the styling on the buttons. You could, and so for us right now, actually it has worked out pretty well. So now we still have that single pageness. Okay. Um, and, but we could, uh, you know, so we could get the benefits of jQuery mobile like so you know our current view class for example the set method change to delegate it to jQuery's change page so so you know so we still use the best bits of jQuery mobile which is and we use their custom events like page in it to basically refresh the scroller for example after the page is in it and the, but we can also still keep using our single page infrastructure which is already test driven and and because we had this testing setup we wrote, we could quickly write you know Test specifically for mobile as well. So on mobile, if it's delegating to page change versus actually calling <laughs> up, change things like that. So it has worked out pretty well for us now actually. Now that we know what how to turn things on and off. So and those we have blocked about. So you can go. I mean, obviously we found it on the internet. I don't. I, mean, I didn't claim to invent those things, but it was just hard to find because they were all scattered all over the place actually. Any other question? Okay. So, uh, just quick, one more quick announcement. I mean, so I, I you know, really love watching demos like, you know, uh, front end and, and, you know, similar demos, Lispy script, really amazing stuff. So, we run a demo club, uh, which we sort of modeled after the Silicon Valley computer club that used to exist in the 1970s, where people would just show up and show what they've built. So, the idea is to encourage people to show stuff that they are hacking on, working on incomplete, small stuff, as little as I built a sorting algorithm to you know, I I made this, I found this neat way to do managing your CSS or whatever. The idea is not to show because there are a lot of startup events, but so we want to do demo clubs. So the URL for that is uh, so we'll do the meetup on 28th, which is a Thursday. But just go to about me. You know, it's, just take the URL if you can. Okay, it's demo club blr about me dot com <laughs> about me slash demo club blr. And so please show up and uh, you know show these hacks to other people there as well, and encourage your friends to show their hacks. I think let's get the thing out, out of people's head that they have to have a startup to show people something. So, so we are against that. We are fighting that trend basically. So help us fight that trend. <laughs> Thanks. So we do a quick break and then we finish with the slash talk. Okay. Great. <laughs> oh, you want to do an LM shake again? Why were you there, Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's enough. Yeah. 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 Y
Thank <laughs> you.